today is Codis's Process Automation Day. How to automate a factory in the process industry. How to program a distributed control system DCS with Codesys. This important question will be answered from IO Automation. Andre has 25 years of experience in the process automation. He has deep, deep knowledge of IEC 61131 programming languages. Andre wrote the first IEC 61131 process automation library, including visualization. His IEC 61131 process automation library and visualization will be available in the Codices store in North America soon. So yeah, thank you, Chris. And uh, everyone, my name is Andre Guillaume. I'm with IO Automation. I'm the founder of the company. Um, today, I have the opportunity to speak to you on process automation and specifically I get to introduce an IEC 61131 compliant uh, process automation library. And just a little bit about myself. Uh, I have a degree in electrical engineering. I have close to 25 years of experience in process automation. I've worked in multiple industries um, and I've specialized in continuous and batch process control strategies over the years. And I have quite a bit of knowledge in the IEC 61131 programming languages. So I first just want to start uh, by kind of talking about where we stand today in terms of process automation uh, and process control systems. So the first PLC that was invented in 1968 was a Modicon PLC. Fasting, fast forward to today, decades later, our computer systems and process control systems are very high tech. Uh, we've got very powerful controllers capable of controlling thousands of IO points, uh, IO networks that are very fast, very intelligent networks, IO cards that are configurable, universal IO, electronic fuse protection. We're landing field wires directly to the uh, screw terminals on our IO cards, HMI networks uh, that span an entire plant. Um, chart recorders are a thing of the past. We've got data historians, powerful reporting, database connectivity with SCADAs. So technologically, the process control systems are very advanced. Uh, as well, over the decades, we've had some really great engineering contributions that have resulted uh, in industry standards. These contributions have come from the industry collectively as a whole. Here's a list of some of those standards that uh, are kind of directly related to process automation. We've got standards on alarm management, batch control, human machine interfaces, uh, instrumentation tagging and symbols, safety system, cybersecurity, but there's one standard that is very important for this presentation, and that is the IEC 61131 standard for programmable controllers. And we're gonna get into that more later, but not only do we have high advanced uh, process control systems with industry standards that they're kind of based around, but we also have market competition. We have several different vendors in uh, the process uh, that are uh, offer process control systems that all kind of offer the same features functionality and they're all very good. Uh, the leading uh, vendors are, and, but um, you know, there's, they have a lot of, like I say, similar features and functionality for the process automation industry. A lot of them have pre-built library for process automation. So, in terms of control systems, we have a lot of good options at this point uh, where we stand today. So all is good, right? Well, not necessarily if you're an end user, there's a problem. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is most all of the process control systems today are closed systems. They're very closed in nature. And by that, what I mean is, and you can see from this slide, if you're programming your automation code and vendor A's development environment, the, their IDE, you can't port your code from vendor A's development environment over to vendor B. 
it's not possible. You can't export your code to a formatted like XML file and import it into vendor B's development environment, continue programming, compile the code, download it to vendor B's controller. You can't do that. You're stuck on the vendor A's development environment that is tailored and specific for vendor A's controller. Likewise, you can't compile vendor A's code into a runtime and then run that code on vendor B's controller. Not happening. Also, if you have vendor A's controller, typically vendor A's controller only works well with vendor A's IO and hardware. Now you can argue we have open network protocols, Ethernet IP, EtherCAT, Profinet, Modbus TCP, we have all of those. However, unless the vendor discloses uh, their device configurations for those that IO hardware, you might be able to monitor some of the points from their IO, but you most likely won't know what, uh, how to communicate with that device, how to configure it uh, in your controller. So even though it's an open protocol, it's still very closed in nature um, and by design, believe it or not. So what's, what are some of the fit pitfalls of closed systems for end users? Well, like we just discussed, there's lack of code portability and reuse across different vendors. There's, you become very hardware dependent on that particular vendor. So if you're a, a large process facility, a plant, your only choice, yes, there's competition, but your only real choice is when you first select your uh, process control system. Once that is in place for your plant, you now have all your operator consoles that are uh, tied to that vendor, all the graphics, all of your code, all your network infrastructure, your IO hardware, every, all your hardware and software are pretty much dependent on that vendor. That, that then runs into potential supply chain issues if there's an issue with that vendor's supply chain. Um, and you're subject to that sole vendor's licensing support training costs. So you're really stuck from that point forward for large systems with that specific uh, vendor. Also, if you're at a plant and you happen to have another uh, process control system, you almost have to take a divide and conquer approach to maintaining, supporting, and making changes to that uh, control system because every vendor's programming environment is slightly different from the next. And there's nuances to their uh, controllers or hardware. So you may have, have a uh, large plant, you may have half your staff that's trained on certain control systems and they're experts in those, but they don't know these other control systems. And so you've got uh, issues there as well as just licensing costs for uh, the different development environments for all of your automation staff to be able to make changes to the code. So there's lots of issues with closed systems for end users. So what's the solution? The solution is the industry standard IEC 61131. With this standard for uh, automation code, we can now develop our code in vendor A's development environment. As long as it's IEC 61131 compatible, we can export our code to a formatted XML file and then import it into vendor B's IEC 61131 programming environment. Then we can compile that code in vendor B into their runtime specific for their controller and then um, continue on with using that controller to controller plant or a process. So this gets us there part way, right? So now we've got code that we can port from uh, one vendor's development environment to another vendor's development environment. This still doesn't solve the problem of hardware dependence. So what's the next part of the solution? The Codesys platform. Codesys, it has an IEC 61131 compliant 
programming environment, a development environment. You can write that code. And if you exported it in the formatted XML file, you could import that code to any other vendor's development environment that's IEC 611.31. Also, they have a runtime, code assist runtime, that you can compile their code, install uh, their runtime on any industrial PC. So they pretty much any industrial PC, any operating system will run the code assist runtime. Once you have that, the CODASYS runtime is compatible with most all open network, IO network protocols. So now the doors are blown open. Now we are no longer tied to any one specific vendor's programming environment or their hardware and their IO networks. So CODASYS, but along with IEC 611.31 enables independence and reuse. So some of the highlights here I have are, uh, oh, I just wanted to mention IEC 611.31. So when people think of that, they typically, if somebody says, what's that? And they're in automation and you say, well, it's uh, you know programming languages like ladder, structure text, function block, sequential function chart, continuous function chart. Everybody that's an automation person typically would say, oh yeah, I know, I know what that is. But again, just because uh, they're programming in that language doesn't mean it conforms to the IEC 611.31 standard that makes the code portable. Part 10 of the standard is where the code portability and reuse uh, is defined for the standard. So again, with the CODASYS platform, we are now able to run automation code with any industrial PC. And I got a surprise for you coming up later. Uh, and on any operating system. So this leads me to our mission at IO Automation. Our mission is to develop independent and reusable automation code for end users and integrators based on widely adopted industry standards and practices. The key words, again, independent and reusable automation code. We want our code to be hardware independent, operating system independent, reusable across industries and reusable across applications. So that in fact is what we have done for the process automation industry. We have developed an IEC 611.31 compliant process library and built on the CODASYS platform. And off to the side on, on this slide on the left are, is a list of the main uh, function blocks that we've developed for the process automation industry. If you're in that industry, you will probably recognize most of these. These are very common throughout all of the leading control systems and have been for years. So probably no surprise. So with CODASYS, with our library, uh, we have, CODASYS has the visualizations component within uh, their platform. With our process library, we have developed uh, the graphical interface for our modules uh, using the CODASYS visualizations. These would, are a great solution for just a local HMI, a small system such as a water utility well or a wastewater lift station uh, or for skid-based packages that are smaller systems. Um, they, the CODASYS visualizations would also be a great fit for a local fallback at a large facility in the event of a plant-wide HMI outage or a network failure. You could go to your right over and run the web viz view visualizations and uh, have the same graphics that uh, we've developed on another platform, which I'm coming up to. So the CODASYS visualizations are great. They're very powerful, but they're not really ideal for a plant-wide SCADA, a plant-wide process control solution. So we, at this point, IO Automation has their process, our process library that we've developed, and we've built it 
on the CODASYS platform. So it's an IEC 61131 compliant process library. But for a plant-wide solution, we, we need to add something. We need more than just the function blocks for the process library. We need a SCADA platform. So at IO Automation, uh, we've used many different SCADAs, but hands down the most powerful, flexible, uh, the best SCADA platform that we've ever used is the Inductive Automation Ignition SCADA platform. Uh, so just some highlights of this. It's a proven system. It's been around for many years now. It has, it's very scalable from small systems to very large plant-wide solutions, it has full redundancy capability, uh, built-in historian, operating system independent. You can install ignition on Windows or Linux. Uh, it's very easy to install and upgrade. It, I, sometimes I feel like it takes longer to download it than it does to install it, believe it or not. Um, it supports UDT tag structures, which is very important for the object-oriented structures uh, that CODASYS um, has the ability to have in their platform with their object-oriented capability. And there's some other highlights there. One very compelling reason for uh, the Ignition platform is their unlimited licensing model. So their licensing is scalable, but they offer an unlimited licensing, which is huge for a process control system that's plant-wide, where you have lots of users, you've got management that needs uh, reporting capabilities, operators that need access to their uh, consoles, engineers that need to be able to uh, develop. All of that for one fee is completely unlimited. You're not getting upcharged every time you need to add tags to their system with the unlimited licensing model, which is very cool. So what would happen if IO Automation took our process library, it's IEC 61131 compliant, and has uh, HMI, SCADA, graphics, scripts, tags, everything configured that um, interfaces well with our IEC 61131 function blocks. And it's built on the CODASYS uh, compliant platform that's capable of being uh, running on the CODASYS's controller runtime. And we use a high powered HMI SCADA platform. I'd like to now introduce the Freedom DCS. The Freedom DCS is just that. It's, a, it's comprised of three components. It's not an official package, but when you put these three components together, you now have a hardware independent and plant-wide capable process control system. Some highlights of what we're calling at IO Automation, the Freedom DCS. Again, hardware independent, you're free to choose your controller, your uh, the industrial PC of choice, and your IO networks, your IO hardware. You're now operating system independent for your service, servers and clients. You can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux. You would now have an extensive reusable process library. It's scalable from small systems to plant-wide control systems and fully redundancy capable with the SCADA server redundancy offered by Ignition, controller redundancy through the CODASYS runtime and network redundancy uh, by way of EtherCAT. Now, I think I was told uh, recently that CODASYS is coming out with uh, redundant Profinet, I believe, don't hold me to that, but that would be fantastic as well. So here is an example of truly hardware independence and extreme capability. So in this example, we're using an OnLogic Factor 200 series industrial Raspberry Pi. They just come, came out with this this year. And I know it's hard to believe when you think of Raspberry Pi, you're thinking of uh, hobby electronics, um, Bitcoin full nodes, uh, all sorts of use cases, but in an industrial setting, no way. Well, now it's here, negative five degrees to 60 degrees Celsius operating range, um, really 
uh, interesting product. So the can, Codesys runtime can run on a Raspberry Pi. So you take an industrial Raspberry Pi with the Codesys runtime on it, then pick your flavor of uh, IO network protocols. In this case, we chose EtherCAT and pick your uh, hardware that you would like to run on that network. In this case, we used, uh, in this example, the Beckhoff EtherCAT IO. So it's, this, is extreme, this is an extremely capable, I know it sounds crazy, it's a Raspberry Pi, but it's a very fast processor on some bench testing. We had uh, upwards of a thousand function blocks in our process library loaded on a Raspberry Pi with a scan rate of less than 20 milliseconds. That, if you're in the machine discrete automation world, that sounds very slow, not possible for coordinated motion, high-speed robotics, but in the process world, that's extremely fast. In the process world, we're typically scanning um, our function blocks at a quarter second, maybe even a half a second. Sequences could be a second. So 20 milliseconds, boom, mind-blowing, that much code running. And EtherCAT is extremely fast. If, you, if you're not familiar with EtherCAT, it's worth looking into. Uh, it, its uh, bandwidth is unbelievable. And so in our bench testing where we uh, had this Beckhoff IO connected via EtherCAT to a Raspberry Pi, one could argue, well, yeah, you have all those function blocks running on a Raspberry Pi, but there's no way you're gonna control all the IO that um, would uh, go along with that code and those function blocks. Well, with EtherCAT, that's not the case. Ethernet IP, yes, you couldn't do it. Uh, you'd scorch the Ethernet processor and it would give up. EtherCAT, the same amount of processing power for one rack of IO is the same amount of processing power needed for thousands of IO points. That's the beauty of EtherCAT and the power of EtherCAT. So here's the same, the same example, but with a redundant architecture. So as I mentioned, Ignition Server has redundancy. Codasys Runtime has redundancy. We can put uh, two of these on Logic ra Industrial Raspberry Pis. Again, I'm just using this as an example. I'm not pushing on Logic or Ignition. We're not financially tied in IO automation to any of these vendors. It's just an example, but it's just showing the extreme capability and redundancy capability. And with EtherCAT, there is EtherCAT cable redundancy. So now you have a redundant SCADA, plant-wide powerful solution, redundant controllers, very powerful, believe it or not, and uh, redundant EtherCAT IO network cable redundancy. Pretty awesome. Not to mention the Freedom DCS is very cost-effective. For an industrial PC and Codasys, the, the OnLogic FR201, just using that as the extreme example again, $350, and it can run a lot of code. Codasys runtime visualization, OPC UA, this is approximate, I don't know the numbers exactly, but ballpark $850. Then you add the plant-wide SCADAs to it, which again, Ignition has scalable pricing model of 13,000 for basic pro, the ultimate 30,790. So imagine being a large processing facility, lots of users, lots of tags, data historian points, reporting needs, and for one price, 30,790, it's unlimited. And redundancy is 1.5 times that. So that would be about approximately 45, something $46,000 for completely redundant SCADA system. So this leads me to some of the common features now looking at our process library. And this is both graphics and function blocks. These are common features from the IO Automations library. We have, as I mentioned, HMI displays built with both the Codasys visualizations and inductive automations ignition package uh, with faceplates, status displays, configuration displays, and trending. 
uh, where appropriate. Uh, our function blocks have modes. This is all pretty standard stuff if you're in the process automation world. Safety interlocks and permissives. Uh, we have a security model uh, built into in inductive automations uh, configuration that is pretty cool. It's based on your plant hierarchy model. So if you have equipment in uh, a certain area of your plant that only certain operators are trained to control uh, based on where your equipment tags are in the hierarchy of folders and ignition, it automatically inherits the permission privileges the tag does for that area of your plant. So you create a new valve, you drop it in a folder, boom, it gets all the security inherited for that area of your plant. So you can't have an operator in a different area controlling equipment that they don't have the privilege to control. There's, uh, we have historian configuration capability from our uh, displays, alarming, uh, alarm information capability. So if there's additional information in the database, uh, for an operator, when an alarm comes in, that information is available. So I want to now just do a little walkthrough of our faceplates. I'll try to move through this a little quickly because I can get hung up talking about the features. This is an, our analog input. Again, th this is an ignition faceplate, but our visualization and codices looks almost identical. and uh, some of the features, scaling of your process value, limit-based alarms, rate of change alarms, input filtering, uh, alarm, aggregated alarm indication, and acknowledgement right from the, from the faceplate here. Here's a, a status screen for the analog input, just showing the different failed status uh, and some more detail for the process value the unfiltered value, percent of range value, and you can simulate the process value from this screen as well by clicking the simulate PV. This is the alarm screen. Now you could acknowledge the alarm from the faceplate, but if you went to the status and the alarm screen, you would see all the alarms for that particular device. This is where you can acknowledge the alarms, but this is also where the operator could shelve an alarm just for that device and unshelve the alarm. Here's the alarm configuration screen. So all of the alarms for the analog input <clears throat> are showing on this configuration. You can enable, disable the alarms, set the severity. The severity uh, dictates the color of the alarm and criticality is by the sort sorting in the alarm summary. You set the alarm limits and delays on the alarms and determine whether it requires acknowledgement or not. <clears throat> this display is uh, the same display for all of the alarms on any of our modules. So it's a common uh, alarm configuration for any, any module in our library that has alarms. This is our discrete controller. Uh, faceplate. So in this example, it's a valve showing the modes. Like, again, we try to use uh, high performance HM high guidelines for our color strategy. Um, and so the status is showing open. You have command buttons to open, close the valve, the alarm acknowledgement. This display allows uh, configuration of the discrete controller. So the controller has commands and states, and you can map your IO um, to your given state and as well to your command. So it's very flexible, one discrete controller for all your valves, your motors, any slide gates, any devices that you might have that are uh, discrete IO. As well, if you need to invert outputs or add uh, pulse outputs, you can configure that. Here's our interlock screen showing 16 interlocks. Uh, the first out interlock condition is flagged. In case you have multiple, multiple interlocks that come in at about the same time, you can tell which was the first interlock that uh, commanded the equipment to the passive state. 
uh, the interlocks, if they're configured to be bypassable, can be bypassed from this display as well. Here's our PID from the process library. Uh, some features we have. The PID algorithm itself is based on the ISA standard PID algorithm. Uh, there's different structures that are supported, proportional integral derivative, proportional integral only, proportional derivative, proportional only. We also have external reset feedback capability, which is a really cool feature if you're not familiar with that. Another term for it is uh, dynamic reset limiting. Uh, very useful for override control, split range control, valve position controllers. So if you're in continuous uh, control world uh, and you're not familiar with that, I want to look into that a little bit. There's some other features in here, nonlinear gain change, bumpless gain change uh, that's optional, bumpless mode switching, set point ramping uh, that is can be based on rate or you can give a, your set point ramping a target and a time to ramp to the over uh, a time period to ramp to the target any reset wind up and initialization some other features here so fully featured uh, pid function block here's an example of a cascaded pid loop in the continuous function chart language. So this uh, example was a, uh, an example of a heater at an oil refinery where we have the natural gas fed burners uh, on our heater and we're ultimately controlling the outlet of the heater's temperature. <clears throat> and that's cascaded to the pressure of the natural gas feeding the burners. So, um, you can see our primary loop is the temperature controller, the secondary loop is the pressure controller. Something to point out here, just by dragging this wire from the output of our primary to the set point of the secondary, these two function blocks behind the scenes are communicating and passing data back and forth. All of the back calculation data and initialization, any reset windup from the secondary is now propagating automatically behind the scenes to the primary loop. All of our regulatory uh, modules have that capability. Here's our trend display. So right from the faceplate, you click on trend, this pops up. And uh, this is the easy chart in the inductive automation submission. Very powerful trending tool. Uh, one cool thing here is you've got subplotting with the same cursor across both, that spans both plots. So you can have your output in the uh, bottom window and your PV set point at the top chart. We have a totalizer. The totalizer can be configured as either accounting or target based. If it's accounting, there is no target. It's just you enable and disable the totalizer and it accumulates the uh, input, totalizes the input value until it's reset or disabled. With a target, you, you give it a target, hit start, and then you can you command your equipment such as a valve or a pump to, to then activate or open, turn on. And as it gets close to the target, it'll stop and there's uh, auto adjustment uh, tuning capability that can be enabled to where it will uh, stop in advance so that it'll the, all, the final uh, amount added will be uh, more precisely hitting the target. Um, some other features there. This is our sequence or phase module, and we call it sequence phase because it can be used for sequencing. If you're uh, in the S88 world, this would be kind of like a, a batch equipment module and you can use it that way or you could also use it if as a phase because in, within this module built in we have the phase state machine so the commands and states uh, in this example is air handler on and off work in conjunction with the 
uh, phase state machine. And um, there's some useful benefits in designing it that way. So if, you, if you're S88 and you have a batch software, you could use this module and the phases from your batch would interface with this phase module in the controller. We have step message indication and prompting. Here's an example where uh, their operators were uh, issued a prompt to confirm that the dampers were open. They can confirm that by saying yes. And there was a prompt alarm generated. So if they're not on that screen, they'll get the alarm on any screen that on their console. So here's an example of what the code looks like for in the controller for that sequence phase module. So here's our air handler and uh, we have the plant is modeled based, uh, the folder structure is modeled based on the plant. So in this example, we had a building with an air handler and inside the air handler folders, all of our modules and the sequencer uh, has two sequences off and on. So uh, these sequences off and on can be programmed in any language of your choice. So if you wanted to use ladder uh, and use a step integer to navigate through your sequence, you could do that. If you wanted to use SFC, you could do that. You could potentially even use CFC for a sequence if you wanted to. So it's very flexible in how uh, you want to run your uh, design your sequences. Again, it's really just a state machine that allows you to drive sequences off of that. Nope. So here's some of the modules that, as I mentioned before, support regulatory control. We have an analog controller, PID, variable frequency drive, override ratio, output selector, and an output fan out block. Here is a, a listing of our modules for the batch world. As I mentioned, the sequencer phase for phases, equipment modules, the totalizer. We do have an equipment duty cycle controller, which is a really cool module for rotating equipment. This is used in continuous as well. Just put it on this slide. But uh, rotating of equipment, lead lag control, uh, backup, failover, is handled by the equipment duty cycle controller. And then the typical function blocks that you would probably use for your control modules. So if you are of the batch world, usually this is uh, the weak link for a, a true plant-wide solution. If it's PLC SCADA based, there's usually a, a disconnect with the batch uh, it turns out Ignition now has batch capability with a strategic partner called Cephasoft. Cephasoft has written modules that are completely integrated within the Ignition uh, platform. And so that's very exciting because now you have a full process control system with batch added to it. So here's an example of how to structure the automation code within Codasys. Um, so we talked about using your folder, folder structure to model your plant hierarchy. This is an example of a water plant. So uh, we've got different areas of the plant, filters, softeners, raw water. And then within each filter are the modules for that filter and if you use programs to then be containers for your function block, that gives you some extra flexibility and allows for additional logic that's specific to a piece of equipment to be contained with that equipment. Um, just some recommendations. This isn't really a training session, so I'll kind of skip, but we do, you do scan your modules with a scan routine uh, within each folder just so that they're easy to find where the modules are actually being scanned and then you build that scan all the way up to the main program that is being scanned by your task we recommend just using one task for simplicity codasys is extremely fast we don't need to be really 
uh, breaking our code apart in different scan rates. Um, so there's no need for that. And it just makes things simpler and easier in terms of structuring our code. Here is the folder structure and ignition. Same thing, model the plant uh, with the folders. And again, the tag security can be based on the plant hierarchy security model, as I mentioned before. So in this example, if we had uh, a temperature transmitter 2066, and it's under this air handler for some reason, if we were to, it, it currently would have all the security for that's um, for that area of the plant, that air handler. And if we moved it to over here to the refinery, it would then inherit the security for the refinery. So operators would have to uh, have privileges for the refinery and then acknowledge alarms, shelve alarms. So that's that's a pretty cool feature that we've developed. So let's see what time it is here. Okay, I think we have some time. So what I'd like to try to do now is replicate a temperature transmitter that we have on an air handler unit. So let me pull up our code. So in this example, here's our air handler and we have a temperature transmitter. Um, Actually, I'm going to show the graphics for this too here real quick, just so we can get calibrated in what we're looking at. So here's an air handler, very simplistic, not fully loaded with equipment or anything, but over here is a temperature transmitter uh, that's showing an alarm. We're going to rep try to replicate this temperature transmitter 100A to 100B. So we go back over to our code, currently online. I'm going to log out. The way I'm going to do this is I'm just going to export the code. So if we say export, where did my window, there we go. And I'm going to deselect everything by default selected. And here, scroll down under the air handler, we're going to pick this temperature transmitter and export it. Put it in this file, name it TT. We're going to call the new one 100B instead of A. Save this. Okay. Now I'm going to open up that XML or that formatted file. Okay, here's our file. Now, what's in here is the TT100A, and we're gonna change that to B. I'm going to say replace all. And just to make sure that I did replace, I'm just going to search for 100B. So that it replaced everything in the file. And I think it saved. Sorry, one more second. Let's open it back up. Let's just make sure here. Okay, so we saved it. So now we're just going to import this right back in. And now we have temperature transmitter B that we're importing. Notice we're offline with the controller. Uh, there are no objects in that. Okay, hold on, what do I do here? I got to select this folder. Let's try this again. There we go. I was selected on a program rather than a folder. 
Okay, so now we're gonna import this. Import is complete. We now have our new temperature transmitter uh, with our function block, the process library function block for the analog input. And we need to add that to our scan. So I'm gonna go in here to our scanning routine. I'm gonna copy and paste that transmitter with our new transmitter. And log in. Sure. Okay, so now we're we have that new transmitter added into the code and we're scanning it. And we did that all online, right? So we just exported an existing transmitter, imported all well online. We didn't stop the controller. Now we're going to go over to inductive automations ignition. the development environment. I'm going to take our existing transmitter, copy it. Now we need to add a tag over here. So this is the manual linkage that we have to do. So we're just going to take temperature A, copy and paste, and rename it to temperature transmitter B. Okay, so now our tag's there. Now we just need to uh, reconnect to the new address within the PLC. So it's pointed to, since we copied and pasted that tag, we need to go to temperature transmitter B in our controller. And now if we just save the file, Save the project, we go over to our window. Notice how the changes easily got pushed out. And there we have it, there's this, the second transmitter. Now I would need to go in and just change the tag name configuration, but, and, and some of the properties of it, but we have a new transmitter added in to the system that has all of the status and configuration capability uh, pre-built, ready to go. So here are some of the screens that we showed earlier in our slides, uh, history configuration, we can go in and change uh, historical dead band. Um, even some of our displays can be overridden. So if you have a different faceplate or a different trend display for that specific temperature transmitter, you can enter the path in ignition for that display for that specific trend. That way, when the operator pulls up their trend, that we go to that specific trend that you've uh, customized. Here's our sequencer module. Um, you can see that the state of our air handler is on, both the inlet and the outlet dampers are open, the fan is on, we command it off, the fan shuts off, we get messages to the operator saying what's going on, closing dampers, the phase machine is stopping, and then we're off, the air handler's off. Likewise, if we start it, same thing. And if we look over in the code, 
I mentioned before, we're using uh, SFC programming language, but this could have been done in ladder, could have been done in whatever logic you want, very basic sequence uh, just for this example. Um, so that's kind of the look and feel of the system. Our uh, cascaded loops are over here on the heater and we'll go through everything, but this is the PID uh, faceplate. And so that's just an example of our, our library. And I wanna encourage everyone to please reach out to us if uh, you're an end user or an integrator, you'd like to start using our library, uh, feel free to shoot us an email We've, on our website. There's a stay connected information where you can be added to our mailing list. So uh, our library has not been released yet. We'll get to that when we go back over to our slides here. Um, our library has not yet been released. We're targeting around February of next year that it'll be downloadable with pricing information. And uh, we're looking to build a network of system partners. So if you're an integrator or your friend, and uh, we would love to start building that network and helping uh, roll out this system. And we'll have some how-to videos on our website and live webinars that we have planned. So a lot of, a lot of things coming down the road. And with that, here's our website, email. So please reach out to us. Thank you very much. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Yes, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Andre. In my opinion, your presentation is a revolution for the process automation industry. I am very happy your process automation library and the visualization library both will be available in the Codices North America store very soon. So stay tuned 